Go ahead. So there's nothing like a field trip or a walkabout read to make it all real, is it? And um, in terms of on the bus and one of the conversations I had, I'd just like to refresh my memory now in terms of our mix of people. Because I mean, at the last stop, we emphasized the importance of having the building inspector. Kate, that was one of our successes in college. We had building inspectors from what, five jurisdictions, didn't we? Yeah, all five, right? And, and it did, did influence the discussion. So. Uh, I know Colmox, for example, had engineering, planning, pardon me, building and building inspector, right? Yeah, so you had three, 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 three there. Uh, <laughs> in, a, in addition to Kate and to Marvin, um, what other planners do we actually have in the room today? Nancy. And you're with Courtney. Courtney. Comox. And Comox. Well, okay, so Comox was uh, two planners. Very good. Any other planners? Uh, the one building inspector. So with everybody else, oh, and Vivian, you're architect. You're architect. I'm planning, right. So is everybody else, everybody else in basic and engineering centric? Fisheries. Fisheries, okay, good. So we, we had a bit of a mix. So if you've enjoyed today, and you're coming back next time, again, our challenge to you is to bring some of your colleagues because, and I think even Tom, you made a comment or two on the, on the engineer on the walkabout, which is, the importance of this whole thing is to actually have the conversations amongst the, the departments, right? <laughs> and so, you know, if you had a good time and you learned something and you think you're going to learn something for next time, then bring your colleagues up. So, enough on this. In terms of this wrap-up segment, again, we're sort of prepare the way for the next two. And this theme, to get to the big picture, it starts with the small pieces. By number three, we will be into a regional context, won't we, Kevin and Derek? But you need to have the building blocks, right? <laughs> and next sec next section will be the, the tools. So very quickly, very high level, I'm just going to leave a quick story here with the consumer guidebook, the you know, performance target target, and the water balance model, and Kate's going to help me out to wrap it up in a few minutes. So you'll see that thanks to Kate, who had some leftovers from the couch and event, there's a number that are distributed on your table, so if there's more people than there are guidebooks on your table, then you'll have to fight over who gets it, but at least we've given it to you. The key to that document was when we set out to write it, and I was the project manager and the principal writer of that document, was we, we were thinking of outcomes, right? So engineers tend to want to be output oriented. Well, I mean, I guess it's part of the job, isn't it? I mean, because if, you, if you're doing design and you're doing, you know, you've got to do all those calculations, but Moving the focus away, to not just the calculations, but what do we want? And that became a bit of a theme of conversations I heard, like with Marvin, right? You gotta know, what do you want? And that's really what the guidebook tells you to do. And what we want is creating livable communities, like extreme health, as you saw from the walkabout, you gotta think about those little details, and, and you know, again, the contrast between the two ponds and reflects different objectives, right? Because uh, Kevin, one reflected a, an early 1990s thinking in terms of a, of a park, the other one re represented a more recent thinking in terms of what it should look like. Same function, but different goal, different shared vision. So <coughs> when it was published in 2002, this is in, in one page, this is what we can learn. It provided direction, and now we have the benefit of looking back six years, that's the significance, providing direction, and science-based, because it, was, it brought together the Washington State biology with our British Columbia <coughs> hydrology. It was, and it was the way you integrated to. And then the guidance on how to do integrated planning, but a lot of times people don't really care about the integration or the integrated planning because you're too focused on, on your immediate priorities. But that's what provided, from a technical point of view, it introduced these core concepts, the rainfall spectrum. There's more than one rainfall day in a year. Whole retain, detain, convey, convey uh, integrated strategy, and I'll show you a graphic in a moment. The water balance methodology in, in 2002 was radical thinking and performance targets. That was our you know, big push, having a basis for performance targets and a learn by doing, unless you build things, unless you look, you know, engineering is about building things and like, you know, how did the Romans get it right? Well, they just kept building bridges until the one stood up, didn't they? <laughs> or aqueducts. So what's the thing about doing? So again, when you think about performance targets, I'm going to start zeroing in now. Uh, to be implemented and effective, it has to support a desired outcome. 
it's not just the number, that's why the outcome is what do you, you know, when, when, when uh, Sandy uh, pointed out the bus window and said, this is where the water you know, comes from, uh, you know, and this is going, it's going into the estuary here, this is why we're doing it, right? That's the outcome. It's got a synthesized complexity. It's one of the things that I know uh, when we talked about developing the guidebook, we said, you know, people don't understand complexity, you've got to give them simplicity. So we had to, we had to give them a number that meant a lot of things. And it's got to be quantifiable, right, Tom? And it's got to be practical, it's got to be flexible, and you gotta have a feedback loop, and you gotta incorporate learn by doing. That's that's the that's the essence of what comes out of that document you've got. Why runoff volume or percentage? Because in local government, you actually have control over that. <laughs> you know, if you're thinking of a, of a of a creek and walking down a creek and doing your benthic and you know uh, sampling, and you get numbers here which show uh, you know instead of your bi bi benthic in index being the desired 40, you got 10. Well, what does that mean? How do you correlate it? Well, the one thing you can measure is what water leaves, or what water comes in, or water leaves. So it's something that through your policies and your practices you have control over. Remember I took you through Andy Reese's paradigms and said, build a vision, create a legacy. What does it mean? It was right out of the guidebook and we said, first of all, it had to be credible. The approach had to be science-based, but it's all about creating a shared vision of what's achievable, right, Pete? And this is kind of, this next point is really um, reinforcing why the success of this kind of uh, series depends on having the departments here, because it is about participation in terms of the decision process. It is about getting consensus, and that was that's what we were doing with, in the Township series in terms of having everybody in the room hearing the same message, having this coming out of the same language, so they were consistent front counter in dealing with the community and with developers, and then at the end of the day. Commitment for everyone, including Tom, <laughs> to, to truly integrate. Well, remember your comment to me about the integration. You know, what, what, tell us what your joke was about planet and engineers. Come on, <laughs> put you on the spot. There's only two planners, so engineers' job is to fix all the problems that the planners are dealing. <laughs> yeah, for all, for all that, because you want here. But I mean, it's but okay. but, no, but he wasn't that bloody. I mean, you, you did preface it by talking about. The integration with the land use plan, right? You know, but you got to know ahead of time what, what the consequences are. So that's really what we're talking about. But it came through. So, Ken, just yeah. an interesting point. That yeah. That goes back to the whole kernel of what we're talking about is working collaboratively. Collaboratively. So yeah. if we all get together on the table before we start doing anything, then there's no problem fixed. Exactly. Tom was nodding his head. Exactly. <laughs> There needs to be more recognition of the impact of land use. Yes. And, and that's the hard, like, that, that was the, you know, in terms of back in 2002, that, that, was, that was the significance of the guidebook by saying it starts with the land use. And, uh, and that was my personal, um, you know, the time saying to people, you know, if you're dealing with council, what do they deal with on a daily basis on Monday or Tuesday nights? They're dealing with the individual piece of property. They're not dealing with the big picture. So why are we talking about the big picture in all of our watershed planning documents? Because that's not reality. But now that you know, we kind of got our act together in terms of saying, but if you understand what the big picture is and where you're trying to get to, then when you're playing with those small pieces, you can figure out how to get there. And that's kind of, but you only get through, through integration, collaboration, mm -hmm. and vision, yeah, and innovation, right? So the four words, right? Um, beyond the guidebook. Okay? So, so it's all about changing the way we develop land. That's what we're talking about. Beyond the guidebook is a very thin document, which is really laying out the philosophical framework of where we're going with things like the new water balance model. I'm also going to point out in your list of um, web references, there's an eight pager, it says it's called an introduction to the guidebook. So it's really great when you have six years later because you kind of look back in terms of the lessons learned and, you know, and, and so the purpose of the, of the introduction then is to hit the basic highlights in terms of what you should be getting out of the guidebook. And um, I was thinking back to some of the comments you made, Kate, which is uh, you don't expect everybody in this room to read the guidebook from 
cover, you know, cover to cover, because it covers quite a spectrum of perspectives. You kind of got to get a sense of where you want to learn from, and that's what the introduction will help you. It's kind of just capture those key thoughts so you know where you want to go with. And I'm coming back to the table of contents in a moment. Hold that thought because the guidebook, beyond the guidebook, from the guidebook, the emphasis was on rainfall capture, volume control at the site scale. And now after six years, we have the benefit of all the lessons learned, experience gained in terms of what we've done. And now we're ready to do the next push, which is, okay, now how do we relate how you manage volume on the ground, on, on the site, to what you see in the stream? And so using, Sandy, the example we saw today, you know, we're kind of up in the, up in the in the bush, right, in a, in a detention pond, what is the relationship between what was taking place on that site and the estuary as we drove by and the bus coming here? That's, that's where we're at. But we can't get there in one leap. So part of like today and then October 24th and November 21st and is to create some of those building blocks which will help you get there here in this room, but you know, getting there is gonna take place after, uh, after November 21st. This, this is, a, this is a graphic I created a decade ago, and it kind of captures a lot. Am I blocking you very much? Can you see it? Okay. Because back in, 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 in um, 1998, you know, when the science on the biology side was just coming together out of Washington State in terms of how land use was impacting on the stream corridor, you know, and, and for British Columbians especially, the, you know, the stream corridor is the, it's the canary in the coal mine. And so, you know, uh, what, we, what we did then was we were characterizing the decades, and this is the significance of saying the 60s, you know, was the was protect property, but in terms of a pipe, not a piping, because is that, I, I was called the city of Vancouver solution, right? They, they covered all their creeks, and now they're building all their creeks. And then into the, into the 80s, sort of in reaction to the 70s when we were now building ponds, but the ponds didn't reflect a full understanding of what was happening in hydrology, right, Ian? We were still having erosion. So you had a pond, you were shading peaks, but you were still eroding. <laughs> because, you know, you had size from the And so, you know, a decade ago, we were at a point where, you know, we were in a salmon crisis. Just think back, it was only a decade ago, a decade ago, we were talking about the salmon crisis, and we were looking at this whole biodiversity and abundance issue and saying, well, the 60s and the 80s, we were losing biodiversity and abundance, coming back to the, uh, you know, as you, uh, our environmental person. So, when you ask the question, well, where do we want to be? Well, we don't want to be going backwards. We said, well, how do we move forward? Well, I can tell you, in 1998, our philosophy in British Columbia was, if we could hold the line, <laughs> we thought we'd be doing well. If we, if we could stop more erosion, that was considered to be a success at the time you started putting in your first ponds. And so that became a 20-year vision. And, and, um, and, then, and then we said, well, you know, if we can be successful over a 20-year period in holding the line, well, maybe we can begin to think in terms of a 50-year vision of making things better. And this actually became the basis. The city of Kelowna was the first council to base a policy decision on this graphic, followed by Burnaby, uh, Port Moody, uh, equipment where council said, okay, we buy into the fact you gotta have a 20 and a 50 year vision. And I'll tell you, in 998, we put a big affordability th threshold counter good and we said, what, what do you think we really can do? And we said, we don't know. We weren't optimistic we could get into making things better. And then, they, I, by the way, this, this graphic is starting from a, from, a, from a developed perspective, because obviously, we you started with a virgin watershed, you're going this way. But this had been the reality, right? This had been our reality in, in 998. This is what we were used to seeing. Start with green yeah. watershed and progressively lose things. Well, a decade later, my experience, what I'm telling you is, I believe what we thought was unachievable a decade ago is within our grasp. Because our whole change of thinking in terms of our site development practices is what's given us the optimism that when we think differently, we come up with different solutions. That's why I think the, uh, the, 
pawn, was it, you know, those two pawns in sequence is great because you do see, just in the look and feel, you see the difference between early 90s and a 2000 design. It's just, I think you, you, several times you said, you, know, you, you basically use the design to make your language. And it's, I'm not saying that those two pawns are the, are the other example, but I'm saying in terms of having a picture, which, you know, in your mind as to what we're talking about, yeah, it's a different approach in terms of what we're trying to achieve. And that's what gives us confidence that, you know what, the way we, the way we develop land, we actually can do a lot better. We didn't, a decade ago, we did not think that. So, watch my time. Going back to 2000, why, why did we begin to turn it around? Because we started to understand our basic hydrology. We stopped thinking in terms of the, uh, <laughs> the rains once a year. Started thinking about, we know the volume is causing the impacts, how can we begin to manage it? So this was the first shift in thinking, which is when we said, okay, look at how many rainfall days we have and where the volume is accounting for. So when we looked at the 180 days of rain that we get in this region, Appreciate that. 180 days. Yeah. Well, I can remember, like, many years ago watching it. Remember this scene before we had more choice on TV? I remember watching, uh, whatever that was, at 7 o'clock, was that show from Seattle tonight. I always remember them talking about, in the Pacific Northwest, you know, every second day it's either raining or gray, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Now I can tell you why. And that's what really brought it home about most of the, you know, of the rainfall. is very small, and you got these other 10 or so events that are, uh, yeah, we're heavy actually. And that's the significance of the volume that you were referring to, that you can sort of see that you know, three quarters of the rain falls in the light channels. And then that led to the integrated strategy. And this is the graphic that's at the heart of the guidebook, because when you, when you stop thinking in terms of just one solution, but thinking in terms of it's, it's, it's a combination of strategies, like, you can't do it all at the site level, but you can do a lot at the site level. And then there are things you've got to do at a neighborhood scale. That's what your ponds are showing. That's the neighborhood scale solution. And then you know, the reality is when you're at a watershed scale, um, if, we, if it's the monsoon season and everything is, everything is saturated and it's all coming off, then you, from a public works point of view, you have to be able to manage the monsoon, right? So, but it was, it was breaking the thinking down into those three basic components. And it was my wife who told me when we were, if you look at the guidebook, the language is a little bit different. But when we were finding this graphic publication in a professional engineering journal magazine, it was my wife who said, stop talking like an engineer. And she was the one who started saying to me, like, well, what do you mean? Well, you're talking about light showers, are you? Because uh, we had, you know, uh, major storms, small storms, you know, that kind of stuff. But, she, but as, a, as a lay person, she could relate to light showers, heavy rain, uh, extreme storms. But, Getting us thinking in terms of what we're trying to do. We're trying to keep rain on site as a site solution. You can't keep it all on site necessarily. So at the neighborhood scale, you're trying to delay it. And in the worst scale, scale, you don't want to cause flooding, so you're trying to reduce that over potential. So that became a graphic. And that's where the water balance model became such a key tool, right? Because we, we didn't have the engineering tool to do the site solutions. The water balance model was a tool. Um, again, understanding how the rain falls, being a tool that you can play with different configurations of development. So say if I have a total rainfall, you know, what can I do given constraints of ground and space uh, and you know soils? Well what can I do to alter that red? Is it gonna be that much red or you know, is it gonna be that much red? And once people can kind of see the visual, they can come up with different solutions. So made an EC tool. Demonstrates a light hydro hydrologic footprint. I'm not going to try and do a demonstration of the tool, uh, other than to remind you that it calculates volume. <coughs> Those are the parameters. Uh, when you go to waterbalance.ca, you click on Map of Canada, click on BC, that'll take you there. And the new tool, the three scales of the application, it is the watershed scale, it is the neighborhood or development, it is the site. And I'm going to quickly show just two examples. We use this as part of the, actually this is prepared by the District of North Vancouver to make the point about how we develop. And uh, Kate, you notice that I've taken all the stuff off of the distractor. <laughs> just Richard Bowes of, of, of North Vancouver District, who's been quite
quite proactive in terms of how to communicate this kind of stuff to, to the residents um, and the council to, to you know, using this GIS to identify two properties of about the same size, one a 1950s house, one a 1990s property, just to illustrate and make the point to the council that in the 1950s, the way people developed, you know, the hard surfaces were only about a third. We don't have blocking the No, you're okay. okay so just think of that's not just think of any think of any 1950s houses we have, right? And then of course now think in terms of any of these houses built in the 1990s, well, the hard surface is now roughly half, right? And so so what does that mean? In this case it would have been worse if you put that so long as they had a tree and there was a tree covenant under the uh riparian regulations. So would it, would it, in this 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 particular property, the uh, the tree you know, the riparian regulations actually made it, makes it better. What he wanted to show, and this is what he showed um, Council, was that, you know, how famous, part of this. Yeah, you start off, this is in 1950s development, and his whole point was, the Green Council was, well look, things are getting worse. <laughs> and you're wondering why, uh, why in McKay Creek, which has been fully built out for 50 years, we have uh, major erosion problems. That was his basic point to Council, because it changed the site characteristics, there's more runoff, we're dealing with more problems in 2000 than they did in, in the year 1960. And they also then did some scenarios showing, well, you know, even, even with this 1990s development, if they, if they approached things differently, he was able to demonstrate as an example, okay, they could have done better. So it was showing how, and this, and this is the message he had to council was, we're not progressing, we're going backwards, we're making things worse, but we could do better. So the only point I bet with this slide was, it's a tool that enables you to build a scenario comparison. <coughs> um, so where we are now, after two years of basically changing out the engine and integrating a, a tool called Final, Final, we're uh, literally a week or two away from taking the beta status off the, the current water balance model. And uh, it, it will be the new version which, which, which uh, meets the needs of engineers goes beyond just being a planning tool. This is where I want to call Kate to help me out. To tell me, describe to people the outcome of the Couchin series and what we're going to do. I'll be I'll be brief. Um, we had a similar series in the Cowichan Valley where I, I think it was more of a mix within the group. It wasn't quite so much engineers. We had building inspectors, we had planners, we had subdivision uh, approving officers. Um, we had a couple of interested uh, consultants that we worked with. And the idea was essentially, when we took some of this information that, that Kim's kind of gone through with you to the regional board, the regional board really liked the idea of moving towards water-centric planning. We just finished uh, the Cowichan Basin uh, water plan that really looked at some pretty substantial challenges between supply and demand, and we recognized that uh, certainly there are a number of areas within the Cowichan Valley where we're essentially drawing down our groundwater much faster than it's actually being replanted. So they're, they're really struggling with those particular issues. So we went forward to them and said we'd really like to do a sort of a train the trainers and really train the frontline staff in every single organization in the regional district so that uh, when you're standing at that front counter or speaking to a property owner or a major land developer, that they're not using the language that we hear quite so often. You people are doing this to me, or how can when I go next door to the next municipality, I can do all of these other things which you're, you're making me do really wanted to work on building a team, a uh, regional team, uh, to give people that sense that they weren't alone in that progress, and also to allow them to sort of meet each other in, a, in an offline way uh, through professional development. We offered professional development credits through the course. So we, we went through that process. I think it was pretty successful at the end of the day. I think we started with about 65 folks, and over the course of the summer and people's vacation, it kind of ebbed and flowed. We ended up with probably about a little over 50 folks towards the end. Um, and then we said, well, okay, well, what's the next step? We want to change, we want to change more use uh, in terms of policy. We're going to be changing some of the metrics and some of the expectations, particularly when we look at the new provincial policy, which is really big language right now. How do you put it into action on the ground? And 
so the next uh, session is we've decided that we're, instead of just creating a policy that we tell our major developers this is what you're going to have to do, we're going to have a forum where we invite, it's by invitation only to our major developers in the area, asking them to come and join us uh, for the day. We've asked essentially, uh, it's going to be a two-part day, so they're going to come, the major decision makers. It's always a challenge when you invite, who are they going to bring? We recognize that some of these folks are incredibly busy and, and time is money, so we've asked them to join us for about an hour and a half, two hours in the morning, and they can leave their technical staff behind uh, for the remainder of the day. So they're going to hear some of the, the large ideas in terms of the tool, so we'll be saying to them, this is where we're going, this is that we're going to be using or we're thinking that we'd like to be using it. We really want to work with you to make sure that when we put our policies into action and we create the models that you understand them and that you've got an opportunity to inform them. So we want and we're asking them to be sort of the early adopters within the communities. We'll work with them to make them successful. Um, and what we're putting here is some of the language in Bill 27 which allows us to decrease development costs and uh, decrease uh, permit time. So we're saying if we're successful at the end of the day in building this model that works for you and it works for us, this is the benefit to you. So we have staff that are now trained and, and understand some of the, the water balance issues, have a general understanding of uh, when they get the output from that program that they'll be able to fast track it. They won't be looking at one set of engineering drawings and not understand the language or not understand the philosophy. So it's, it's a consistent approach. And so we're going to have uh, essentially three case studies. One is uh, Bamberton, which is a uh, development of about 2,000, between two and 3,000 homes if you include secondary drilling. So we'll be using that as a case study on their sort of a watershed uh, scale. We'll be looking at a, a community kind of neighborhood scale with another development and then also uh, we're, we're not quite sure at this point what the individual home sort of site development is. So we want to give them three examples of how they might use this tool uh, in a way that's really straightforward for them and invite them into the dialogue in the same way that we invite our peers into the dialogue. That, that's, that's good. Okay. Yeah, yeah and um, just trying to think what else to add to that because yeah, because I think I guess the other thing I just to elaborate a bit is, is that the uh, um, in 2004, the city of Courtney hosted one of the first water balance model training workshops uh, when we were doing a number of pilots to different audience groups, and, and, and it just happened that in your case, it was tailored to the uh, to the stewardship committee. In fact, Kate, that's that's you, got, you took that course. That's right. And, and and the difference between 2004 and today is in 2004. I mean, you know, we weren't charging for it, but in effect, uh, you know, like in the uh, workshop state, we, we sold seats at, at, at a, in a computer lab. And so it's a totally different approach to move from selling seats in a, in a computer lab than to have a letter from the chair of the regional district inviting uh, specific individuals who you already sounded out. And such that when you mentioned the case, study, we should say that, you know, we've asked for volunteers to use their projects uh, develop the case studies and we will support them technically to show them to keep it simple because in coming into our into our forum is so they can present to us what they've learned and so in terms of how we're going to be structuring that day just to add to a little bit of detail the morning we're calling establishing expectations which is you know, the regional district local government saying well this is this is what we want right this is this is what we want and why and in the afternoon then becomes okay this is how you meet expectations and that's Really, it's um, just, uh, in terms of the user group and the reviewer group. I was going to say it's role playing, but no, it's real playing because you know with these three case studies, in effect, what they're doing then is making the the pitch to the local group reviewers and, and the guys from develop services basically from the regional municipalities of how how to use the tool and present the output to expedite the decision. So that's the uniqueness of it, as opposed to hey. We got seats in a computer lab. Um, yeah. uh, under our sustainability strategy for mortality, uh, developers workshops was being proposed with all following the staff engineering stuff the building inspector with the development committee. So it's just going to the steering committee right now for the development board. So just we'll, we'll probably follow the following and I actually want to go to yours because I think we want to all agree with the dialogue context. So we don't well, 
that's that's part we're here. Like you know, uh, anything we're doing, we're saying is this this is not you know this is just the beginning of something. And so when we get to number three, like we said with couch, and we said, well, this is not the end. It was the beginning of the next phase. And actually, just as a way to connect the two, the way today was designed was the way couch number three was designed. So we kind of flip things around. So who knows where we'll be by Courtney number three. But we do have homework for you, right? That's why we gave you the guidebook. <laughs> and uh, it was cuts and goes to whether we would have any copies to give you out because of you know, having to find them. But you do in your handout have the, the table of contents, Tom. <laughs> I'm going to keep picking on you. He won't come back. Don't no, come back, please. <laughs> Seriously. Um, just when you look at the table of contents, just identify what's relevant to you. That's all. And, you know, um, write your conclusions on one of these cards. What do you think? And so when we come back next time, you can report back out. We'll have a segment where we just get you to talk about what you, what you thought. So maybe I can give you these, you can hand them out to people while I wrap up here because. Do we have gifts? Yeah, I haven't broached that yet with um, <laughs> Kevin. Yeah, they had bribes. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And uh, <laughs> there was one pretty good bribe, which was uh, oh. Dave Hewitson, who was the building inspector for the city of Duncan. Even offered up his, his cabin on an island with a so he would take you over in his boat a cabin a weekend away yep. from a cabin that would fit four people so that's pretty nice. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So I uh, thank you for doing that, Kate. You invited him to the next week. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm going to suggest you do is take your card and slip it into your copy of Living Water Smart on page 43. Because page 43, you've seen that, you've seen a quote from it twice. I used it, Katrina used it, but by 2012, we we're expected to. Just leave it there as, a, as, a, as, a, as your file point, because maybe, maybe maybe three of you out of this room, maybe three of you are all just keen to do it, but we will, we will, we will come back next time. So, um, because we will try to have some overlap and continuity, because if there are new people coming in next time, we're going to have to recap today. But that's your homework. Uh, you've got the list of web resources, so you know. And the presentations are going to be on water bucket. They'll be on water bucket, and I think that Derek, when we were talking, because it's a month to the next event, now that you've got the email commute list, we'll start communicating with people and kind of saying, exactly. "Here's the link. This is where you find the, the, the presentations." And don't forget, do your homework. Right? That's what we'll be saying. Don't forget to do your homework. So. Make sure we spell the email addresses. Yeah, it's water bucket B U C K E T. So don't just copy and paste that one where it says B C U. <laughs> that changed them on the website, right? <laughs> I I'm done. So it's up to you. So I'm going to quickly wrap up. There's about two minutes left here. Keep on doing the timetable. Make it two minutes long, hopefully. So thank you all for coming. We hope you learned today from visiting the site and listening to the presentations where Courtney has been and where we're at today, and hopefully where we're going to go tomorrow. Uh, I encourage you all to come back to the next two sessions to see the follow-on from this, learn from what we've learned today to learn more, as we all are doing. Um, I'd like to pick on two things which I have noted here. That, uh, two themes not to forget about. One is Kim's, the new business as usual, and Derek's achieving more with less. I think you've seen that today. Um, my other point is to thank particularly Derek for all the hard work you put into putting this together, and Craig, and Sandy, and Tion, who uh, did registration today. So thank you all, and uh, all have a safe journey home, and we'll see you back here in about a month's time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, we met my objective, which was to get around here by 3 o'clock, and we're about 3 minutes ahead of schedule. I don't know that. We're credible.